Uh, welcome to this talk. I'll, ju I'll just give you a little introduction and then Boan will introduce our first speaker. So welcome to this very special talk in the holiday period. So thank you for coming and uh, braving all the viruses out there and uh, being with us today. I just wanted to um, let you know that this talk uh, is organized as part of the relationship that NTU has with the Wallenberg Foundation. Uh, from the Institute of NIST, the Institute of Science and Technology for Humanity. For those of you who may not know about this, this is an institute that has just more recently been uh, started at the university, where we really try to fund research and support research at the crossovers of science and engineering and humanities and social sciences, really interdisciplinary research. So if you're interested in this, uh, then please follow up with us. Uh, you're always welcome to join our team and our community. Uh, so with that said, I hand over. Thanks, Vanessa. So um, thanks for coming. My name is Bo. I'm from the School of Computer Science and Engineering. It's my great honor to introduce our first speaker this afternoon, um, Professor Frank Dikla. Um, he's a professor of social social network AI at Umeå University, Sweden, and uh, he's also associated with Utrecht University in Netherlands and uh, Czech University of Technology in Prague. Um, he's a fellow of uh, the European AI uh, Association, and um, he has made significant contributions to um, the field of multi-agent systems and uh, social simulation. Um, and he has uh, published um, lots of papers in uh, uh, important venues in AI, and, and uh, he has organized many uh, important uh, conferences and, and workshops, uh, including AMAS, I believe. <laughs> So um, I guess without further ado, um, let's welcome uh, Frank to give the talk on uh, uh, this real AI is the social AI. Okay, thank you. So thanks for the introduction. Um, thanks for all coming here. Um, I don't have a, a lot of time, and I want to warn you that this is not a talk about uh, results for one small project. This is more a talk about uh, arguments why some kind of uh, uh, research area is really interesting and what it entails. So uh, social AI actually is uh, making AI being social. So it's not about using social media or whatever for AI, but it's about making AI social. So I'm going through that a little bit and I try, try to make you curious about what it is and why it would, would be interesting. And then if you want to know more, then you can mail me later on. So actually, I'm leaving for the airport at half past five, so I'm really uh, going running r straight away. But uh, the email address uh, you can find easily on the web. Going this way. So if you talk about uh, uh, social AI, it's good to start talking about artificial intelligence first. Uh, uh, if we start talking about artificial intelligence, let's see what's intelligence. It's the ability to perceive or infer information and to retain it as knowledge to be applied towards adaptive behavior within an environment or context. Um, if you look at this, this doesn't say learning. It says you have to perceive, so you have to be situated, perceive and get information inside and do something, something with it that actually makes you behave in a better way, in a more comfortable way, in a way that you survive in a, in a very dynamic environment. So that's, intelligence is all about that, living in an environment and doing the things uh, in that context. So doing things in accordance to your context. So artificial intelligence is the research area that studies human intelligence through the design of computer systems that emulate parts of human intelligence. So it's a research area. That's why it's red. So if I hear people saying, oh, what is the AI in the system? Then I ask them, do you also ask, what's the biology in the garden? Do you know about the biology or do you know about the chemistry in the garden? No. You ask about the plants or the animals or whatever. So there are all kinds of uh, technical things that are built in this research area, but AI is not a module. 
It's not a module that you can add to a system and then it becomes an AI system. It's a research area with a certain goal. And if we limit it to this kind of idea of it's a module that we can add to another system, we are very narrow-minded. We miss more or less 90% of the interesting questions, and let alone the 200% of interesting answers. So bear this in mind. This is a research area, and we have to think about what that research area is about. So um, there is a kind of standard book on, uh, textbook on AI, and it's from Russell and Norvig, and they have this kind of list of all kinds of parts of AI, problem solving, knowledge reasoning, uh, uncertainty. Oh, it's there. One of the things, learning, neural networks, all that. So deep learning is one of the things of learning. Um, that's one of the things that are part of AI research. So it's one thing amongst many. So the techniques used in the sub-areas are part of AI research, but not all systems that use these techniques, they are AI systems. So you can use all these kind of techniques that we develop. You can use, for instance, logic to take a non-neural network stuff. You can use logic to do all kinds of stuff, but it doesn't mean that then your system becomes AI. So I would say an AI system is really a system that is meant to emulate some part of human intelligence. It doesn't have to emulate complete intelligence because that's very hard. We don't do that at all yet. But it should have that intention of doing emulating human intelligence. In the other way, it doesn't mean that I, now I'm saying anyone doing deep learning and not doing AI systems, that's stupid, it's not useful. No, it's very useful. But we shouldn't claim that everything that's AI is only that. So there's more to AI than only deep learning. So why is this, uh, why I make this argument so strong? Why I'm using all this time in my presentation for that? Well, uh, deep learning stuff is a lot about pattern recognition. And this is one of the applications of pattern recognition. Does this person have cavities in her teeth? So you show this x-rays and the, the system, the, the, learn, the, actual, the, the system that learned to look at the patterns here, they're better than actual dentists doing this. So I know this because my dentist, he went to a conference and he told me exactly about this. So that's why, because, so they did actually do this in practice and all of those dentists tried to figure out how many cavities they found in the x-rays and the machine did better than they did. The answer is yes or no. It's very simple. We have cavities or no cavities. But we're more interested in this kind of questions. So where and how can we best receive refugees? Like from Syria. Is that yes, no? No. That's not a yes, no question. And uh, is there a best solution? Well, with the cavities, you can say the more I find the, the real ones, the better my system is. But do I have something like that? Can I optimize this other question? No, it's far more complex. It depends on all the parties involved and depends on when you find a solution, how that solution works, what are the consequences? Maybe when you try to do something, then doing that actually brings to light all kinds of new issues that you didn't discuss when you thought about the solution. So you have to restart the whole process. So these are the kind of wicked problems, which are the real problems in the world. And if we want to have AI doing something about it, we have to understand how people do this. How do we reason about it? How is that all these people that interact on this kind of problems, what are their motivations? How do they negotiate? And how do they come to a solution? And we never have something like this is the best solution and then everyone accepts it. Now we have to find some solution that people can accept. And because people accept, it becomes a good solution. Even though maybe objectively we could say there's another solution that we think is better. So doing this right thing, you can't actually do that with machine learning, with pattern recognition, because what are the patterns? Very often, we don't have the data on how this should be done. Every war is in a different country. Every time, the situation is different. So we don't have a 
a history with a lot of data that we can learn from what's working and what's not. Because now situation is different and the past uh, solutions don't work at this moment. So social AI is about this right type of questions. It's about the real issues in the world uh, where more than one person is involved. So intelligence, what we call intelligence, by definition is this social thing. We always work in a context with other people and we have to take into account what other people motivates and how they think and what they want. And if we want to have AI working in that, supporting that, that sh it should become social as well. So intelligence and social. One uh, example, I learned about that uh, some months ago. Who knows how a toilet works? Can I? No one knows. No one dares to raise his hand. So normally, when I ask this, people say, yeah, I know how a to toilet works, because you go to the toilet, you flush it, and then sometimes you have to clean it. But um, actually, what we know is how to use it. And actually, we usually don't know how this thing actually functions. So how does the water sucks down and how does that part work mechanically? There's some ingenious uh, things that going on there. And most normal people have no idea. If you're not an engineer, you don't really know what happens. But we only have to know how to interact with it. So even the things that we use every day, things in our house that we really need, we don't really know how they work. But we know how to call when it's, uh, when it's broken and who has to repair it. So there, we know people that know how it functions. And this is typically social. So our society is very complex. There are a lot of things, and most of the things, ask me. I'm a computer scientist. How does this laptop work? I have no clue anymore. When I studied, I used to know exactly all the, the hardware and the software and all those parts. Nowadays, forget it. Most of those machines we don't know anymore. But what we do know is that there are other people who are specialized in these parts of knowledge, and we divide all the very complex things among a lot of people, and then we make social structures so that the society actually works. We interact in a way that all that knowledge all the time comes together so that we can do our normal daily business. So how does that work? How does society work in a way that it always works? So what are the social structures that actually make it work? <coughs> so um, it means that in general, um, it's not something like we have um, our own intelligence and then we build on top of that some social stuff, which is a bit how most of the Western society looks at it. It's something more fundamental. And this is more the African way of looking at things. Umuntu, Nugumuntu, Nagabantu. And it means a person is a person through other persons. So you are a person through the persons around you. So the person that you are is shaped by the person around you by your parents, by your siblings, by your friends. It's not that you in, just interact with them. No, they also co-determine you're shaped by your interactions with all those people. If you have a lot of very nice people around you, you might also become a nice person and the other way around. So you take over ideas, you take over habits, you take over the way that you think and uh, decide about things from the people around you. So our thinking is not just individual. It's something that we do in this context of other people. So it means that we can't build a system standalone as an individual and then say, and then we connect it with some function calls to other systems. Now, those other systems really have to be already in the inside. They have to be connected from the start of the system. So. <coughs> Let's see how this uh, 
works a bit uh, with people. Um, so basically, everyone has a set of values. And there is a, a theory on uh, uh, values that uh, says that there are like 10 or 11 values that everyone has over the whole world. I did empirical studies. So they're very abstract things, like um, universalism, which means we are thinking about more than our uh, selves. Um, achievement, we want to get somewhere. We have to uh, um, learn and we have to develop ourselves so that we reach some stage. So we want to develop in one end. Um, so there are this kind of values of what you find important. And they determine in some way the actions. But of course, uh, universalism, I have a high level of universalism. So do I go have dinner at home? Well, that's kind of. Yeah, maybe. I still have no clue. So there are some things in between. So things like affordances. Um, if I uh, am in a uh, bar with friends, then maybe uh, that affords me to have a drink and then maybe phone home and say, well, I, I'll be late. Maybe I come after dinner. So the context, the present situation, and the things that I can do might make me do things that otherwise I might not do if I wouldn't have that context. I also have motives. I, if I want to uh, really achieve something, I might say, well, I go practice. So I really want to be the best soccer player. I want to be in the national team. Or I want to be a basketball player, and I want to be in the national team. Um, I practice three, four times a week. And only if you do that, you can get to the national team. So, and then I can't always have dinner. So um, my motives, they drive you. Uh, the affordances, they drive you. And they give direction to the values. They give an idea of how those values translate in, into concrete actions. And you can already think, if you see this very simple example, it's a lot of reasoning about how all the kind of things you can do and how does that work every day of the, for every time of the day. So what we have in the middle is all kinds of practices, norms, conventions, kind of normal way of doing things that actually organize this. So I don't have to think about this every time of the day, every day. No, I do things normally. So I go to uh, train, practice uh, three times a week, and they're fixed times. So on those times, I will be home late. I will not have dinner. In other days, I might be there. Um, so there are all these kind of things, regularities, in the way that we do things that actually make it easy to reason about all these translations of what I want in life and what I concretely do. So um, I have this. Mm, yeah. So this part of organizations, norms, conventions, and all that, that's the, the sociality. That's society. That's shaping the way that we do things together, how we have different roles, how there is a presenter and there is an audience, how there are teachers and students, how there is a plumber and there is a carpenter, and there is someone uh, working in government, and all those kind of diff different things. So all those things, they are there in this cloud determining how things will, in the end, work out. But then when we make those actions, they also shape back those kind of structures. So if I have a practice, it gets reinforced when it works well. So if I train very hard and <clears throat> I get to the national team, I get a kind of a reward of, oh, I should really train. I keep training because it's so nice and I get some result. So it reinforces some kind of doing things in a certain way. And I bet now you can think about your own life and think about all those things that get reinforced all the time because they're working out. You don't always have to be exactly in time. You can come in like 10, 20 minutes late, and it's still OK. You feel fine. But if you get a negative reward and the presenter starts picking out and saying, <laughs> why are you late? You should have been in time. You should not be too late. Then maybe next time he will think, well, I don't really want that kind of shit. So I'll be in time. So we can change this. And, but if you get away with it and it's nice, then you keep the practice. OK. Um, 
So already uh, Confucius, uh, he thought about this things. There is this going from values to actions, and there is the going things of rules of society to actions. So if you think about the norms and conventions and all that, they give a kind of regularities which are easy to follow. If we all follow them, society will run smoothly because we know what to expect from everyone. But it doesn't always work properly. Situations don't always conform to what you expected when the norms were formed. So you have to be able to handle all these kind of exceptions. And when you want to do that, you go back to the values. What is really important? So sometimes you go to the values and then you say, I make an exception here, and usually you follow the, the norms. Having the balance between those two, that's what Confucius was calling humaneness. Being human means knowing how to balance between the principles, the values that you stand for, and the norms that you keep for being in, in a society with other people. So those two things together, they're the way that we should be. And that balance, that's not very easy to program. So if I talk about this, I see people saying, yeah, yeah, OK, yeah, I recognize this. It's very interesting. So now build this into an AI system, because this is what humans do. This is our intelligence is doing this. So there is some kind of steps in between this and have an implemented system. So. Um, I start using this, so what I want first is to model this, implement this part, and it's kind of silly putty. Does any one of you know what silly putty is? Some people, all the, all the generations, they usually know. <laughs> it's a kind of a clay. But, um, so let me tell you what it is. It's this. It's, uh, it's chemistry. Everyone, if you've read it a few times, any chemist will say, oh, yeah, I know what it is. So it's actually a, a detergent that you use for the dishwasher together with flour and some other things. Uh, all things you can find in the house, you put them together, and you get this kind of clay thing. But then, of course, what's interesting, this clay, if you uh, mold it, you can bounce it. It's a very, it's kind of a rubber thing. So it bounces. If you want to describe how that works, you don't use this chemistry. You use physics. So you use this kind of things. But then, of course, it's a children's toy, and you can actually throw it uh, around and take it apart, make it into di different parts, and throw those uh, separately. And how do you play with it? Well, that's a different way of describing what you do with it. So this siliputi is something that you learn to play with. And then it's clay, so you can actually make it in all kinds of different shapes. And certain shapes, if you shape it into a ball, it's better to bounce. And if you want to make a figure, then you shape it into a, a dog figure or so. So depending on what you want to do, you shape it. And you learn what's the best way to shape it. That's why it's so interesting for kids. They learn to mold it in all kinds of things for whatever they want to do. So why is this all interesting? So silly putty, I've been describing it now in already four different ways. So what is it? Is it this chemi chemical formula? Is it this uh, physical formulas? Is it something different? It's all. It's very moldable. It's not something that is fixed. And if someone uses it in a certain way that I never thought about, it's still the same thing. In the same way, I can think about norms. So I take norms as one of those things of social structures. Um, I can think of the social part of it. It's forbidden to discriminate. And then it's from the social side, I want some kind of situation to happen. And it's a rule that should be consistent over all situations for all people. So it uh, serves some kind of a purpose on societal level. And uh, then I have paradoxes there on that level. There are things that uh, um, I have to paint the fence white, but um, I, I cannot paint the fence white. But if I did it anyway, then the gate should also be white. It should be at least one color. 
So how can that be? Because it was forbidden, and then you say if it's done, but it, it shouldn't be done. So how do I solve that? So here it's about reasoning, consistency, societal view. In the bottom, it's about the interaction. How do those norms arise? Social norms, they emerge from the way that we interact. Suddenly, people start uh, wearing these uh, masks much more because of the coronavirus. So it's a situation that comes up, and then people see a lot of other people using those masks, and then think, well, maybe that's a good thing, so let me also do it. And then everyone starts doing it. Why is it the best way? Well, we don't know, but better be certain. So um, we do things because other people do things. This has nothing to do with consistency. It's about uh, being like other people and following a pattern and reinforcing patterns. So this is not something logical. It's about adaptation stuff. And then in the right side, I think that's the cognitive thing. How do I use those norms? Are they constraints? No, they're not constraints. They tell me what to do, but I can decide myself whether I keep to it or not. And, but there are consequences. So I reason about what happens if I uh, follow the, the norm and when I violate the norm. And then I also can think, oh, if I really want to start my presentation in time, I will leave early from the hotel so I'm not late because I might get stuck in the traffic jam. The taxi might not be able to find the exact location. So uh, it also uh, affects the way I plan things. So a lot of the things that I do, my deliberation, is affected by those norms. It's not just a constraint on what I can or cannot do. So there are different ways of influencing what happens. And in the end, I can say, uh, it also is the formulation of that norm. Um, forbidden to run in the corridor, that's a very good one for children. I never thought about running in the corridor, but you say that and I think, well, let's see what happens. Because running is... So um, if you say, well, we walk in the corridor, yeah, it doesn't say run, so yeah, we, we walk, okay, fine, no one will notice. So the formulation, and here there are many examples, framing something in a certain way will influence the way people make decisions. So language is very important. So all of them uh, have some, uh, pick up some aspect of norms and show how that uh, is used. What I argue is that we should look at all those different aspects, they're in top, of the different social aspects and look at them um, actually uh, separate. And based on what we actually want in a system, we choose techniques, we choose neural networks, we choose logic, we choose something different. So we don't start with the techniques, we start with the fundamentals of the social aspects that we need. Okay, I'm just... <laughs> The product that I should uh, hurry, uh, should finish at five, I think. So socially aware is exactly about how do I make systems to behave responsible in their social context? How do, do they cope with all these aspects of norms and all those other things in a way that they function in this context with other people? Is this useful? Um, I've been talking a lot about high-level stuff, very abstract. Um, I've also applied all this in uh, many different uh, contexts. So social simulations about drug trafficking. Why is it that when the police, they uh, actually found out a lot of uh, drugs in the, in the Rotterdam Harbor in the last years, and it didn't seem to make any difference in the amount of drugs in the streets? How come? What's happening there? Well, you do some social simulations and you see actually what's happening. So quite surprising. Um, and it's so surprising that I'm not allowed to tell you exactly what it is because they're actually using that uh, result now. Um, radicalization, how do normal people become terrorists? Or do they become uh, uh, stamp collectors? So once uh, they become something dangerous, and other ones, they just become nerds. And uh, how come? What's the reason for that? 
Um, policy making for a sustainable environment. We did some work on that. Um, then a completely different thing, dialogues and communication. So we want to have uh, training for professionals. We actually do this with uh, medical students to learn to have conversations with uh, patients. So we build a, a kind of chatbot environment where the students can practice. But of course, this environment should be kind of realistic. If it's too mechanical, they don't learn anything. So that's another thing that we try to do. And we did serious games and tutoring, training for stress, lifestyle changes, and teamwork stuff. So all of that based on the theories on social structures, how people use that in the deliberation, and how that works when they are together, and how that actually influences each other. So is it useful? Yes. I didn't show how this is done, but uh, you can ask me for any of those projects and I can tell you a lot more about all the things going on. So, uh, la almost last slide, open issues. So, the first one is actually, that's a very interesting from a computer science perspective. You would like to have modularity and compositionality and we don't have that. Not on the level that you actually program. So, I can show you a lot of examples where that doesn't work. And that's kind of how puzzle. So how do we actually deal with that kind of stuff? Okay. Um, read the conclusions. <laughs> um, you can have questions after the talk of Virginia. Maybe then you forgot them already. Well, since, since you're leaving early, I'm sure we have time for one or two short questions, if there are any. And maybe if people who want to sit, feel free to squash people to the sides to be able to find seats in the middle. Um, thank you, Frank, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, it's too short, obviously, so you have to return, come <laughs> back, and have this discussion with us more. There might be a, a pressing question that someone wants to ask in the audience. Sure. Uh, Can you like be super loud? Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. I was hoping you could quickly comment on how in a lot of these complex social situations, you're able to model them without this, the simulation having some sort of like common sense foundation of kind of the limits of what is possible. So, um, so the question is how do you implement this uh, in all the social uh, context? Um, well, actually the first step is to um, check what are the most uh, salient features of the, the context for that application that should be incorporated. And then we have separate theories for all those different aspects that uh, we put together in usually agent-based uh, models. So there are uh, some implementations of those theories and we got those ones together. But it's um, actually um, tomorrow there will be a, a PhD student starting in my group to look at the methodology because uh, I know how we do it, but I couldn't actually let other people do it yet. So we really need to work on the methodology to make that very structured, those choices. So that's a good question. Good question, difficult to answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Frank, thank you so much. Um, for our speaker. Something uh, you may not know about Frank is that he used to be a, a Dutch national basketball player. You might think, obviously, because he's so tall. But you know, in the Netherlands, everybody's tall. So you have to be <laughs> super competitive to be uh, in a basketball team. Uh, so our next speaker is Virginia Ding. She has the same last name as Frank, and that is not a coincidence. They are married. Um, they are one of those science couples, you know, yeah. the ones who write papers together and things like that. I don't yeah. know how they do it. I would kill my husband if I had to write a paper with him. Uh, but, you know, all our appreciation for yeah. you being able to do that. So uh, Virginia, uh, I have known Virginia actually from the Netherlands, and Frank also, because we, are, we were both in the Netherlands. Virginia was at the University of Delft, but she is now a professor of social and ethical artificial intelligence at Umea University in Sweden. And uh, she's still associated with the Technical University Delft in the Netherlands. Um, she is here as the scientific director of WASP HS. This is a Wallenberg program on humanities and society for AI, autonomous systems and software. Uh, she's also a fellow of the European Artificial Intelligence Association 
a member of the European Commission high-level expert group, the World Economic Forum Global <laughs> Artificial <laughs> Intelligence Council, the it's executive okay. committee of the IEEE. Uh, she's also at, which is not in the abstract, but she's also a consultant at UNICEF for AI impact on children. And the, the list, I am sure, continues. <laughs> Something interesting about Virginia is that she loves knitting. You may not know this, but she does a lot of knitting. If you oh. happen to be Virginia's PhD student and you get a baby, you will receive a knitted <laughs> whatever you need. So oh, you know that. I have, I have my sources. I see, I see. And there's yeah. something else, which is a typical Dutch thing, but you were not in the Netherlands. I was the same. We, we were both... Girl Scouts when we were little. Yes. You were also a Girl Scout. You know, a lot of... Yeah. It's that folk in a row. I'm getting scared. Girl Scouts. So, Virginia, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All kinds of secrets I had no idea. Yeah, so Frank and me, we work a lot together. We don't kill each other most most of the time because we most of the time are traveling somewhere different. But you will see a lot of things in the presentation which is similar and you will find some of the ideas of Frank which are things we have been working together for more than 32 years. So it's it's not strange that it moves from one to the other presentation. Usually we don't present one after the other so then the things are not so evident but today you will get the, the two flavors. Uh, yes, uh, if I work nowadays mostly with the uh, understanding the impact of AI and also understanding how, um, how can we develop strategies at the policy level but also at the level of uh, uh, determine and uh, design methodologies, how can we implement and use AI in a way that is responsible. And we'll discuss later what is resp responsible. But if we want to really understand how to use and to implement AI, we have to first understand what are we talking about. Are we talking about the field of science like Frank is talking about? Are we talking about the technology like most of uh, us or most politicians around are talking about the, the, the technique, the, the machine learning, the pattern matching? Uh, or are we talking about the magic entity which can do everything and anything. No one really knows where it comes from. Probably it comes down from the sky and starts doing stuff. What are we regulating? What are we uh, approaching? What are we really designing the systems for? And if take each of these ones separately, the approach and answers will be quite different. So what is AI? It is, and I'm repeating Frank for a, a large part, a type of technique, a type of methodology, a type of uh, science in which I dropped my, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, in which we can recognize usually some level of autonomy in the way that the system works, some level of adaptability, of learning, of ad uh, changing, but also doing that in interaction with people. When we're talking about regulating and organizing and using this type of systems, we have to realize that the system itself, so the software itself, is not alone. We used to have systems and software which was alone and running in a, one computer and you could turn off the computer and the thing was fine and all. No, but nowadays the systems are inserted and embedded in our societies at many different types of levels. So when we talk about understanding the use and the development of AI, we have to consider the social technical system which is around. The people who use it, the people who develop it, the environment in which it is used, the cultural differences between the different countries and different people who use it. So we really have to see AI not as a software technology, but as a multidisciplinary, multi-facet type of system, which really has many, many types of uh, uh, ways to look at it. So if you talk about responsible AI or the responsible uh, development and the use of AI is first and foremost understanding that whatever systems we develop and whatever systems we use need to be aligned with whatever legal uh, constraints, legal, legal environment is there. It's also about understanding that these systems should be aligned with our values, and Frank has talked about that before. It's also about designing systems that are reliable, that we can trust, that they don't crash 
tomorrow, that they don't change and start doing crazy things after we use it for some time. So it's really designing systems that we can trust from a technical perspective. I know, and I have proved it, and I have tested it, and I have maintained it for some time, and I know that I can use it in a reliable way. And it's also, and the, most of you are this systems that we develop that are beneficial for society, for people, for humanity, for some of us, but it's really also thinking about what is the benefit of this type of systems. It is also about recognizing that the system itself is not that magic entity, but it's an artifact. It's a tool. It's something that we as people develop and that we as people set the purpose. Even when we're talking about artificial intelligent systems which can adapt and learn and modify and uh, program themselves and reprogram themselves, this is still an artifact. It's a piece of technology. It's something that someone, somehow, somewhere decides on a purpose. It has not a purpose of itself. It has not a will of itself. It's not responsible in itself. It is a tool that we use, and we set the purpose. And from there, we really have to start thinking about a completely different way on what is the ethics of this system, what is the responsibility of these systems, who is, is the, it's not just about the trolley problems. It's not about, when we talk about AI ethics or uh, responsible AI or trustworthy AI, it's not just about solving trolley problems. It's not about deciding whether the uh, self-driving car should kill the old lady or the chicken. It's about fundamental types of um, problems. It's about deciding what type of system are we developing and why are we developing this type of systems. If I can de develop a system which is 95% accurate, but this gives no explanation whatsoever about the results, or I can des design a system which is 80% accurate, but does give explanations, which one of them should I go for? And if I'm going to buy these systems or use these systems in a hospital, for instance, to decide about people's diagnostics, or in a bank to decide about mortgage, which of these systems am I going to use? These are the AI ethics that we should be talking about. It's about designing chatbots in a way that we can trust that it is benef they will behave like a person when it is beneficial, but it's not, it's not a case in which mistaken identity might lead to problems. We really need to understand it is a machine we are interacting with, uh, and we have to understand in which cases we should decide how much of emotional behavior, how much of nudging, how much of behavior changing support are we putting in the system because there is a benefit to it and how much do we really need to decide on how to make clear to people that you are interacting with a piece of software. It's about deciding how we combine the, inter the use and the application and the deployment of this type of technologies with the benefits for society, for people which might be being replaced or transformed the way they work uh, by interacting with this type of people. So there is a lot to AI ethics, to about uh, AI uh, responsibility, which goes much far beyond the, the simple and the uh, toy cases of the trolley problems. Unfortunately, a lot of uh, many organizations are aware of this. There is a lot of work the last two, three, four years about understanding and providing principles and guidelines to the use and development of AI in many different areas of the world. At the European Union, uh, by the IEEE, which was one of the first ones deciding on that, the OECD, and in fact, by the last count, I think there are 84 different types of principles and guidelines, so you can also start picking and, pay, uh, and choosing which ones fit you or your interests best and come with the one. And so many countries have done it. I don't really know if Singapore has some national strategy and principles and uh, yes. Uh, if you want to know all of them, Helen Winfield keeps uh, trying to uh, compete with, it's a, it's a rat race and you don't know which the, 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 cat, uh, the cat and the mice because every time that he writes it down there appears a new one. So, but anyway, he, he keeps track of them. Uh, and uh, like I said, there are many of them being developed. Fortunate, and one thing, why are all these things uh, a 
appearing in one end. Of course, there is this realization that it's important to understand and to determine what do we as a, a country, as an organization, as a region, feel that it's important to ensure and to align with which principles is it about to align. It's also very nice and very important to show we are endorsing a certain type of AI in our region, in our country, and so on. But by endorsing it, besides giving very nice pictures and very nice uh, dinners with the uh, presidents and so on, we are by far not there. Of course, it's important to have the principles, but we really need to understand how can we comply with these principles and what does it mean to decide that we want trustworthy AI? What is that? And how are we going to check that the, the software, the algorithm that I'm developing is indeed trustworthy? And what does that mean? Uh, it's also good, uh, all those 84 types of uh, uh, principles, in a sense, they are all quite similar. They all talk about it's important that transparency is important, fairness is important, uh, human rights is important, accountability is important. Of course, no one wants an ethical AI. You could not really sell a system by saying, yeah, here is the, an ethical one, please uh, take mine. Uh, you, it's easy to build this type of principles, to talk about this type of things at this level, but it's very difficult, like I say, to move to the um, how oh, do we endorse it? Many of these organizations are already working on that. So the European Union is coming very soon with regulation. We don't really know what they are going to regulate, uh, but um, it's, uh, they are working on that. The IEEE is already for quite some time working on standards, really technical standards to understand what is transparency of a system, what is fairness in a system. So there is a lot of work there. And OECD is taking a more observatory type of approach, looking at what's happening and keeping track of the different ways. But if I go a bit back, and this is a lot of the work, like I said, I, I've been involved on that. Uh, Vanessa has been involved on that. So maybe from 84 things we have been involved on, uh, 85 of them, maybe. <laughs> but uh, so there is a lot of work, uh, a lot of issues on this, especially from the last few years. And why is that? Why? F uh, all of a sudden, seemingly two, four, three, four, five years ago, everybody started talking about the AI ethics. AI has been around for more than 50 years. No one really cared about the ethics of the systems before. And all of a sudden, it's really a matter to us. And why is it? It's actually because of the promise of AI, and especially coming from the developments of the last few years, that AI is going to enable us to make better decisions. The problem here, or the issues here, is what is better, and what has for which these uh, decisions are going to be better. And if we don't really understand these two things, we don't really know what are we doing by this type of systems. So uh, if it's about making decisions, let's just go back and try to understand how do we people make decisions. And there are a lot of studies, and I'm not a, a psychologist or a sociologist about, uh, but we really have to start understanding what is a decision, how does decisions impact us. And it's not only how each of us individually make decisions, but it's also about how we make decisions together and how all of us decide whether we should go to the movies after this, or should go home, or this, uh, uh, how do we like this presentation, or don't like this presentation. So we really, if in many cases, and because AI affects all of us, we really have to understand how we can develop and decide and design this type of decisions together. We have been doing that for many years in many uh, societies, and uh, elections is one of the way uh, it, it's an artificial system like AI. It's a system which enables us to aggregate different opinions and take a, aggregate the a, a average opinion, if you want, which we are all uh, happy enough to live with it. It is a system that we design, and as any other system, the design, the system, the way we design it will impact the type of decisions that we can take, and those decisions will impact, impact society, and that society will impact again the design and so on. And as with uh, elections, the way we formulate the choices that are there the way that we are involved or not on the decisions or on the impact of those decisions, how we aggregate it, it impacts the result. 
and if the Brits had had other choices than just yes or no, maybe Brexit would have been a different uh, option. If uh, the way that uh, votes are aggregated in the United States would be a different type of aggregation, Trump would not have been the president because they are, if you look at the majority of votes, there were more Americans voting against Trump than in favor of Trump, but the way you aggregate it. So do, do the systems that we decide impact the decisions that are t making there? So we are designing AI. AI doesn't come from sky. So what, let's start first to decide or to think about which decisions do we want an AI system to make? Just think, for instance, of a self-driving car and what type of decisions you would like the self-driving car to make. Any idea? Which decision should the self-driving car do? Braking speed, yeah. This one? Why not? We somehow want those cars to decide whether they should kill a chicken or an old lady, but we don't think they should take this type of decisions. Why not? It's a boyfriend who takes that decision. <laughs> no, really seriously, we really have to understand what are the type of decisions that we as society and also as developers are willing and are interested and are happy and comfortable enough to let systems build. Because if how we think about the t any decision that you ma we make, people, uh, cars, or whatever, we can place it in this type of space. There are uh, decisions which are legally allowed, and indeed we hope that any decision that our AI system will make is legally allowed by the legal uh, system in which that system is involved. <coughs> we also can have uh, decisions which are socially accepted. Uh, we, as society, we agree that it's not, uh, uh, we are not supposed to be all speaking at the same time here as the presenter is talking. It's some kind of accept a global, it's, there is no law there. It's also probably no ethics about that. But it's kind of, of acceptable type of societal design. But there are also uh, uh, decisions which we want that they are morally or ethically acceptable. The problem is that in many, many cases, we don't really have a one point in this space in which we know that the decisions will take. And we have to make balance and choices between how much do we want to ensure that the things that the system is going to do are ethical, are legal, are um, uh, social. And if we put them together, we have to make choices. We cannot have all the things together. And we cannot have all those values together. And also, this is not something which is fixed for every person or ever, even for a single person. I can think, uh, we all can think about situations or cases in which, for instance, uh, slavery is something which used to be legally allowed in many countries, is not anymore, is not anymore uh, acceptable any, anymore. Uh, the uh, way of dealing with animals and animal, uh, um, uh, how do you call it? Uh, 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 aggression against say? animal rights, it's also something which changed and changed in our lives. The way we accept or not that people smoke inside this, the, in, uh, in groups is now not anymore legally allowed. But when I was small, it would be per perfectly normal and perfectly legal to, uh, to smoke in a room like this. So we have to understand that these decisions change and um, uh, you cannot put all those principles and all those values together. So we really have to, taking responsibility, designing responsible systems means that we have to understand where are we functioning in this type of spaces and where are we willing the systems to take to, to be, to the decisions that the system take, where we are we willing and comfortable that they take place. So to do that, we can do that in different ways. We can look at the process by which we design the system, so the methodologies, the design processes, the, the software uh, uh, development processes. We can also look at the behavior of the system, or we can look at our own behavior as stakeholders and as uh, regulators and users of this type of systems.
So if you look about the looking at the process, it's about doing the right thing, do it right, and ensure that the values are there and that we do it in a way that it's aligned with all. Uh, let me go quickly. So I had already said this. If the AI system is something like that and we want to take responsibility, means that we have to design the, the have, uh, design process which ensure that as we develop autonomy for the systems, we have to know where are we going to put the responsibility for the, uh, the autonomous behavior of the system. It's not in the system. The system itself is not responsible for what it does, but it's this social technical system which has to take the responsibility. If the systems are interacting with us, we expect that the system is designed in the way that it allows to provide a count or explanation about what it does. If the system is adapting and changing and uh, varying along its uh, lifetime, we want somehow to understand how that is. So we need some level of transparency there. Together, this gets to the art principles, RRT. And this is some work which has been done, done by a lot of people, including my group. Uh, just one of the challenges here, but I will go quick about this. Uh, I leave the challenge. Um, next one is going. OK. If we talk about the behavior of the system, of course, the idea would be the ideal is that we can build some chips or build some uh, software which we can guarantee whatever that thing does is ethical or is legal or whatever. So this is the ideal. It's completely, like I said, unrealistic because we cannot really know whose ethics are there and how are we doing that and in which environment it all changes it. So just to give a small example of that, how that works and how the, if we want to, be, uh, to build a system to be fair, which is something which uh, is a very uh, interesting and very uh, current uh, type of uh, research in AI, we want to build fair AI, the first thing we have to understand is what do we mean by fairness? And there are, I don't know, many different definitions of fairness. If we don't really make it explicit in the design of the system, what type of behave, fair behavior are we designing, we get to many different types of solutions. And if we look at uh, fairness as being providing equal resources to all, we'll get to this, if our uh, implemented system has to do with boxes, we would get to these solutions. If it's about giving equal opportunities, we would get to that solution, for instance. The point here is not so, not so much that th they are different and every type of approach or interpretation of fairness will get a different solution. It's also that these solutions might change. If the kids grow up, then later on the big kid might want to have a, a box to sit on because it gets old and gets tired. If the fence disappears, they will have another type of use for the boxes. So we really have to understand that even if we take a fixed way to interpret fairness, the decisions and the behavior of the system can still change. So we really have to have very formal and very uh, um, explicit ways to represent which are the values, how we uh, develop them into norms and into the requirements, and then how we use this type of explicit, system, uh, the, the explicit representation to understand what is the behavior of that system. Uh, finally, about the regulation, the certification, about our own role as users and developers of these systems. Uh, one of the ways to look at that and to look at trustworthy AI is just giving an example. You're going? See you tomorrow. <laughs> See, we travel in different ways, different planes. We'll probably arrive at home sometime tomorrow, but we go in different times. Anyway, uh, can you ask anyone tell me whether these eggs are free range? Yeah, I know. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Anyway, free range eggs, are, there, are these free range eggs? You never know. If you go to the supermarket, can you buy free range eggs? Yeah, you can you buy many thousands different types of eggs. And how you know that they are free range? You don't know, but you, you. There is a stamp. There is a stamp, yes. So there is some certification there which tells what type of eggs is. Of course, it might be wrong, and there are many cases in which they will try, try to sell, misuse the type of certification. But the point of the certification is that I don't have to know what it means to be a free-range egg. I only have to 
belief or to trust that there is an organization which checks, knows what a free range egg is, checks whether the eggs are indeed free range or not, and tells me what it is. If I'm using AI systems or I'm using AI algorithms and they tell me this is a, a fair, there, there is no one who is, going to, who is able to tell me is this a fair system, is this a responsible system, is this a trustworthy system, we don't really have this type of certifications for AI. Which means that each one of us, as we use it, has to be the engineer or the uh, analyst, which has to go look and decide for, for ourselves what are we using, what are we buying, how are we going to do that. So it might make sense to think about ways to certify AI. It's complex, of course, but there is a lot of people working on this idea. Can we provide some guarantees, some trust? And the point is, even if we, the eggs that we buy are uh, not, uh, we, they tell us that they are free range and they are not, then we have some legal protection to go complain about it. Or we also, all countries have some kind of minimum guarantees for what, that we know that whatever we buy in the supermarket is uh, of a certain type of quality that we can expect it not to kill us directly. So we really need to think about, and I'm, I'm not saying that we really need to go the, the direction of the free range stamps, but we have to think about ways to provide people the trust and the ability to think about how uh, to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, use a certain type of system without really need to go into the details of how the system works. Uh, like I said already before, IEEE is working on the standards. Many, many organizations and systems uh, and uh, um, uh, companies are increasingly working with what they call ethics, ethics officers or advis advisory panels on ethics, which help them looking at their own designs and their own developments, their own products, and set the gu guidelines there. Also, in many cases, are able to veto some projects which they think, no, this is really not ethical and you shouldn't not be do that, and you, it is not adhering to your guidelines. The European Union is providing all types of assessment lists which uh, help people deciding, uh, is my system aligned with the guidelines that the European Union uh, designed? Uh, a lot of work is being doing in uh, education and training. And also there is an increasing in some countries, Australia, but US as well, in which there is an appeal to the civic duty of organizations to voluntarily implement this type of system. So there is a lot of work happening here. And uh, there is not yet a consensus or a way to decide which ones are the correct ones. So I, I finish here. Uh, just uh, AI is influence, an influence of society. It is a tool that we use that is made by people and we as society and as developers are setting the purpose to it. AI can give us answers, but if we don't know what questions are we asking, we don't get there. And that means that we also really have to start thinking about the impact of the use of AI in the education programs that we have at all levels of education, because we don't really need to train people anymore to know answers by heart, but we really need to train and educate people and children to know which questions to ask. And of course, we have to look at these issues of accountability, responsibility, and transparency. And I will just finish with one slide about the VASP HS program that was the reason we are, why we are here today. And it's a Swedish program um, funded by the Wallenberry Foundations, in which the aim is exactly to take a multidisciplinary approach to look at the impact of AI and autonomous systems on humanity and society, of which uh, there is a, a research uh, program, a graduate school, and international collaborations with NTU, possibly. And the idea is that AI is not anymore an engineering discipline. It is a multidisciplinary field, and we really need to, together across the world, start defining what is this scientific field which integrates humanity, social science, technology, in a way that it's not just about designing systems, drop them in the world and see what happens, but really doing that in a coordinated and uh, uh, a way that is mindful of the impact of those systems. So if you want to know more about VASP HS, we have a, a web page and a uh, Twitter feed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
thank you so much, Virginia. Yeah. It's a wonderful talk. And uh, also, uh, this is also a good opportunity to also welcome uh, Ingrid and Kirsten from uh, WASPHS and Wallenberg Foundation, who are visiting here this week. Um, we have time for a question, maybe t even two. One here yeah. and one in the back. Okay, we'll start with you. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. It was mm. very nice, Dr. Digna. Mm. Uh, I have a question on uh, your, uh, where you showed uh, that uh, we weighing ethics, uh, socially yeah. acceptable norms, and what's legally acceptable yeah. or not. Uh, my question is, how would you quantify uh, ethical acceptability and social acceptability? Because yeah. uh, we as people cannot uh, agree on something, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, uh, what's socially acceptable in Sweden uh, might not be socially yeah. acceptable yeah. in India yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so how would you quantify that yeah. and standardize that across the board and apply it to uh, AI? Yeah. Very good question. Uh, I don't think we can quantify it. And it's very nice to show a kind of uh, three-dimensional space and there we points there and whatever. But in a sense, we cannot really quantify uh, moral acceptability or socially acceptance. Uh, we need really to look at that from a more, much more qualitative way, which makes it, of course, much more complex to implement, but means that we have to take this type of decisions into the design process. So it's not about the, the functions that we implement, but it's more about the way and the process that we take to get to the final uh, uh, func functionality. So we really need to have a participatory way to look at design. So how get people, all the different types of stakeholders and users and uh, primary and secondary users that might be affected by the system and get into the design process, into the development uh, methodologies, ways to enable people to discuss this type of issues, to participate in the design, to take uh, a say in what the, the end uh, system is. And if you look at other example that I had with the boxes, I don't know where I have the boxes. It's more about at this top level to think about what do we really mean by fairness in this case, and to have a participatory way to agree on what do we mean by fairness. And then at the end, how we, what kind of require, we get to the requirements to it. And then at the end, the functions are much more a kind of an approximation to this process that we design than a quantification of how much equality of resources and things like that. Hello. Hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, very nice and interesting talk. Um, so my, I have two questions. And uh, one, one is basically, uh, what, what are the, some of the negative consequences which we didn't quite foresee which have already materialized mm -hmm. from uh, artificial intelligence. And the other one is, how are we going to balance uh, the technological advances with job creation so that we don't yeah. end uh, up uh, yeah, yeah. losing jobs? Uh, yes, so uh, first thing is that I don't at all want to give an idea that AI is something dangerous that we should avoid by all means. It's indeed a, a, a enable, an enabler of a bright future to all of us. It will be able to help us as society to deal with a lot of complex problems that we cannot do at the moment. So uh, first and foremost, we really need to invest and to continue the developments in AI. Uh, of course, things will go wrong, and we know a lot, uh, all kinds of negative consequences to what is happening. I think one of the most important things about that is to keep a dialogue and a discussion about what are these negative consequences, to have an approach which is inclusive, which is multidisciplinary. At this moment, AI systems are being built in the large majority by males, by men, not by women, are being developed mostly by white or Asian males, not by uh, black or uh, Latin women. Uh, and, we re and they are being built mostly for the Northern Hemisphere. They are built for, the West, for China, for the United States, for Europe, and it's not really taking into account the whole world. So we really need to take a much more inclusive, a much more um, diverse approach to the development. And if we do that, we probably identify m much more all the 
problems of bias or of discrimination or of um, lack of fairness and lack of transparency because we will be forced to deal with those things in the design teams before those things really get implemented. Did we cover the second question as well? Oh, or the yeah, jobs. It jobs. Yeah, it's going to affect jobs, yes. It's going to affect jobs. Uh, I, I don't know, I don't have a, a glass bowl. Uh, if we look at the past, and if, if we let a, a machine learning or a deep learning algorithm decide or tell us what will be the consequence of AI for jobs, the system will tell us it will increase jobs because the data we have from the past with every uh, technological advancement, we got more jobs. There is a transition period in which things go wrong, and then after that, we get more jobs. Ep that happened with the Industrial Revolution. That happened with the digital uh, uh, com computer revolution. So uh, in a sense, history tells us we will get more jobs, better jobs. And But whether that continues forever like that, and that's one of the issues with uh, 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 pattern matching algorithms, results from the past are not always the results uh, for the future. Uh, what we do have to be aware again is that we really need to uh, be take the discussion about what jobs do we want to be replaced, when should we be using AI, when should we not be using AI, who is going to decide that, how are we going to integrate the different preferences and uh, effects of the system uh, into the design of the system, and again, to to have a dialogue with all the pot potential uh, uh, parties. Great. Thank you very much, Virginia, for the thank talk. You. Yeah. So thank you one more time. Thank you.